The message that I plan to deliver today, I titled initially, Blessed Are Those Who Keep His Testimonies. And then I read something this week that made me to, uh, uh, just forced me to modify just a little bit. The message was already in place, but I had to incorporate a few other remarks. Uh, I read a, a position paper that is on the Assemblies of God website, and for the record, and for all the world to know and hear, I am an ordained minister in the Assemblies of God. But when I read the position paper entitled, Israel, the Church's Response, I knew that I had to respond. And so this message now takes on the title, Israel, the Church's Response, a rebuttal, subtitled, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies. Follow that? I knew that the message had taken on just a whole new meaning and importance in that the, you know, the prophets of old would address their own. Did they not, for the most part? You know, you might say, well, Jonah went to Nineveh. But the prophets of old addressed their brethren. And as brethren, I'm addressing, I believe in the authority of God, in the Word of God, with the authority of the Word of God, my own brethren, in my feelings concerning this uh, position paper. And I want to make it really simple. I want to uh, break it down to the bottom line of what the paper says. I'm not going to read the entire paper to you. You can go online to the Assemblies of God website, go under Issues and, and uh, search Israel, and you'll find it. And I'm gonna, I'll give you the, the two sentences that I believe are the bottom line. But first, I want to say that in, these, in the article, it says concerns about someone like myself, that they call warm feelings toward Israel because of its ancient religious heritage. <laughs> now, let me just challenge that a moment. It is not just an ancient heritage. It is a current heritage. It is our future inheritance. We are co-heirs with the Messiah in it. Our birthright Amen. demands it that we are co-heirs with Israel. Amen. It also says that somehow we are being unfair to the so-called Palestinians. And I could go, I could get into that quite a bit, but I'm going to refrain. I will touch on it in a moment. But the bottom line, the bottom line of the article or the position paper is, the Assemblies of God as a fellowship has been diligent to take an apolitical stance in matters of government and nations, our commitment as Christians must always be that of Jesus to reach the lost, whoever and wherever they are. All right. So let's look at that. Two parts of that statement. Number one was to be apolitical, and number two, that our commitment be that of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul tells us that we are ambassadors. As if God were pleading through us, be reconciled to God. Is that not the commitment of Jesus also? To be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors calling all people everywhere. Be reconciled to God. Every good evangelical should be involved in doing that. And Yeshua's words, Jesus' words, are very clear in John chapter 17. You can turn to John chapter 17 with me. Verse 18. Again, Jesus' words as he prayed to his Father over his disciples and all who would believe in him through their word. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Amen. That they all may be one, as you, Father, 
are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 25, O righteous Father, the world has not known you. The world has not known you. And for the most part, still true today. But I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Amen? Amen. God gave an assignment to his son. Go into the earth and glorify me. Point all men to me. And he was committed. His commitment was to do that. And he said earlier in this prayer, I've accomplished that. I've done it. And now I'm passing that down to my disciples and all those who would believe in me through their word. So it's current. It's a current assignment. And the father that he was referring to, regardless of whether it's popular or not in the world, is the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel is one of the many names that he is known by. Sadly, there is a movement in the, in, in the world today to call God by any other name, and he's still God. And I understand that today, in today's world, in the Muslim world in particular, in the Arabic, that Allah has become synonymous with God. But it was not always so. This may sound like semantics, but it's vital. It's crucial that we understand that Allah is a pagan moon god and that the, that, the, the God that we are reconciling people to is the God of Israel. We must remember that. Amen. And we're doing individuals a disservice if we do anything but. And the other half of the statement is that we want to remain apolitical. Is that the biblical model? I don't think so. It is not the biblical model. Let's build the case for a moment. Using Jesus' words, in Luke 21, verse 33, he said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And thus, he is the word made flesh that all of the word of God will not pass away. Correct? Turn with me to Psalm 119 and note that the psalmist agrees wholeheartedly. Psalm 119 Verse 152, concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that you have found them forever. He has founded them forever. The beginning of that psalm begins in verse 1 and 2. It says, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. Now, just for the record, that, that statement there, who walk in the law, is the Torah. Look it up. It's the word. But I want to focus on the testimonies. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies. That word for testimonies in the Hebrew means witness. A witness. Are we not called to be witnesses for God on the earth still today? If you dig all the way to the root of that word testimonies, the word ud in the Hebrew, it means a continuous or a repeat witness. Now think about that for a moment. When you're trying to establish the credibility of a witness, if you're a, if you're a, a policeman, a detective, a lawyer, and you're trying to establish the credibility of a witness, do you not have them repeat their story over and over and over again? Because if they change their story, they lose all credibility, do they not? A person who repeats the same story the exact same way over and over and over again builds credibility as a witness, do they not? 
Then turn with me to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17. Verse 7. God speaking to Abraham says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, I know that's a confusing statement because in the Hebrew, that word there for everlasting means everlasting. Forever. Not changing. The testimony of God. The fact that the region became known as Palestine in recent history and the fact that the inhabitants of the land became known as Palestinians even in more recent history, only within the last 50 years did they actually take on the name, a misnomer by the way, the Jewish citizens of, of the land were known as Palestinians prior to, that, prior to the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. The Jerusalem Post was called the Palestinian Post. But because of the name of the region was named Palestine and the people somehow now have been called Palestine, does that change our testimony? No. no. Thank you. We lose all credibility as witnesses we lose all credibility in our testimony if we change the story. In fact, the Decalogue, commandment number nine, says don't bear false witness. We are bearing false witness when we change the story. Genesis chapter 15, God cuts covenant with Abraham and then lets him in on a little secret that the people would go into captivity, that the people would go to a land that they would be considered strangers. Isn't it strange? God makes a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, makes an eternal promise, and shortly after cutting covenant with Abraham, lets him know that they would go into a land where they would be captives, where they would be slaves, but later come out. Why? Why? Why would God do that? I'll tell you why. So that they would be the one nation on all the earth that was established by an act of God. Amen. See, all other nations on the earth have been established by an act of self-determination. They've been established by organization, by a government, by an army, by their own self-determination. But the nation and the people of Israel have been established by a sovereign act of God. Amen? In fact, this week, Jewish people everywhere were reading the Torah, as we did Friday night. And they read Exodus chapter 12, the description of the first Passover. And within that passage, verse 3, it says, tell, God tells Moses, tell the congregation. Tell this congregation, and then goes on to give them instruction regarding the remembrance of this event where I would, he would reach in with a strong hand, the mighty hand of God, and would bring them out of the most powerful nation at the, on the earth at the time and form them as a nation. But he uses the word, tell them that this congregation, which again in the Hebrew can be translated assembly, family, a people, a multitude, but once again, the same root word can be found. If you back it up to its root, testimony and this congregation have the same root word, ud, in the Hebrew. That means a repeat witness. What was God telling us? That they would be a witness, regardless of whether they were in captivity, rather whether if they were scattered through the nations, or if they were in the land, Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel, they would be a witness to the one true God of the earth. Amen? Amen? They are a witness. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, a repeat witness on the earth of the one true God. 
even Balaam, the evil prophet, prophet for hire, who's hired to curse Israel as they, as they were gathered in the wilderness, had to say only what God would, would allow him to say or forced him to say. And he said, they shall, they shall dwell alone. They will not be reckoned among the nations. So as we look at the scripture, we have to understand that you have Israel and you have all the other nations of the earth. They are not just, as this letter says, a non-Christian nation, just another non-Christian nation. They are reckoned apart, set apart by God alone on the earth. And all other nations are required to respond accordingly. For all their flaws and all their failures, no, they are not perfect. No, we don't agree with everything that they do. But for all their flaws and failures, unto them were committed the oracles of God. Amen? Amen? The testimonies, uh, the testimony of the one true God, our word that we use today. So how do we, as a movement, as, the, as the, the movement called the Assemblies of God, how do we come up with a position that would state otherwise? How would we stay apolitical? Well, let's take a look. Was it Paul? who instructed us to stay apolitical, the Paul who said we were, we were strangers, we were aliens to the covenants of promise, but now through the blood of our Messiah have become part of the commonwealth of Israel? Amen. That Paul? Hallelujah. The Paul who said we are grafted into the root of the olive tree? That Paul? Or is it the Paul who said, we have been so blessed, we've been partakers of their spiritual things, it is our duty, the Gentiles that is, it is our duty to bless them with material things, Romans 15, 27. It's our duty, he says. There would be no assemblies of God, there would be no Christianity if not for the contribution of the Jewish people. Amen. Amen. Thus, it's our duty. Isaiah 60, 12 says, the nation that does not serve her will be utterly ruined. So then it must have been Jesus who said, stay apolitical. If it wasn't Paul, it must have been Jesus. Hmm. We said our commitment must be that of Jesus. So we combine the two items, apolitical and our commitment to Jesus. What would he say? Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31, Jesus begins to lay out the judgment of the nations. Did you hear that? The judgment of the nations. Matthew 25, 31, it begins, and you know it. He talks about separating the sheep and the goats, right and left. And those who are the sheep, those on his right, are those who were a blessing to a group of people he calls the least of his brethren. And he uses the same language that Genesis 12, 3 uses where it says, I will bless those who bless, I will curse those who curse. He says, come, you blessed of my father, because you fed me when I was hungry, you gave me drink when I was thirsty, you visited, you took me in when I was a stranger, you visited me in prison. You clothed me when I was naked. What you did to the least of these, my brethren, you did unto me. Come, you blessed of my father. But if you didn't do it, you're among the cursed. Sounds just like Genesis 12, 3 to me. But someone said, well, he's talking about all of the poor people on the earth. Aren't they all his brethren? Look at the context of the passage. He's speaking about the judgment of the nations. If you look to Joel chapter 3, you cannot take Jesus' words out of context. Joel chapter 3 describes the same judgment. The judgment of chapter 3, Joel chapter 3 verse 1 says, For behold, in those days at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. Now this same position letter speaks of the regathering of the Jewish people from the four corners of the earth. It acknowledges that. And that it would become, they would be important in the last days. 
But listen to what it also says. I will also gather all the nations. Did Jesus just not tell us that? Matthew 25, verse 31, when I gather the nations, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, He will gather the nations before Him for judgment and separate them right and left, sheep and goat. Isaiah, uh, Joel chapter 3, verse 2, I will also gather all, the, all nations, bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them on account of who? My people, my heritage, Israel. Whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. There it is. The heritage that's not so ancient. It's current. It's future. It's our inheritance. And they can't be any more specific when the entire peace process with the so-called Palestinian is about dividing the land. It is clear. This is the judgment that Jesus said he would take into account. So it's not Paul it's not Jesus, then it must be the Father. Hmm? And speaking of the land, by the way, I don't want it to go unspoken here for the record. Israel includes Judea and Samaria, what the world calls the West Bank. And if anything, Christian Zionist organizations don't go far enough in standing with Judea and Samaria and the communities of that region. Amen? Amen? So it must be then the Father. If it's not Paul, it's not Jesus, then it must be the Father who's apolitical. Huh? The Father who says that he who touches the Jewish people touches the apple of his eye. That Father. The Father who speaks very strongly in Zechariah chapter 8. Let's look at Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah 8, verses 1 through 3 says, Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Zion with great zeal. With great fervor, I am zealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. And this is not talking about the new Jerusalem. It's talking about the same Jerusalem that the word of the Lord will come forth from. Amen. The word of the Lord will come forth from Zion. Amen. In the day of peace that the Messiah will bring. Amen. And their gathering, their regathering is foreshadowing of that. So, apolitical. It's just another way of saying politically correct. Amen. And the church is not called to be politically correct. Amen. We are not. And that is concerning all of the word of God. Amen. The reason this country is going the direction it is going and compromising in the word of God. The reason why the National Cathedral in Washington can say that they're going to marry gay couples is because the church has been too politically correct. And I refuse to allow this church and this minister to fall into that category. Amen. And we will stand. We will stand on the word of God. Amen. And if God is a Zionist, and he is, then I am a Zionist, guilty as charged. Let the testimony declare that I am a Zionist. And you're a Zionist. I can tell by your reaction. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen.